Up to this point, we have all the elements needed to come up with a model describe the behavior of the household's consumption and saving decisions. We have utility to quantify the degree of the happiness of the individuals when they are making the decisions. And then we have the constraints that confines the household's decision related to consumption and saving. So in the following, we want to introduce a two-period model, which is called the visual model, that will be able to describe the consumption saving decisions. So to begin with, the key feature of the visual model is as follows. We say that the model not only describes the consumption behavior of current period, but also the future period. Therefore, we need to at least have two periods for this model. Therefore, a person's current consumption not only depends on his or her current income, but also the future income. In other words, under this model, the consumption decision is based on the resources the household or individuals or the consumer expect over his or her lifetime. So because of that, from the model equations, we know that given the decision is about across time, and we know that when the household save, the household is going to receive interest. Therefore, for this model, the interest rate matters for consumption decision. So what are the assumptions we make in order to come up with the visual model? The first assumption we make is that the individual, the agents, or the consumer, or we can say household, live for two periods, and this person dies at the end of the second period. The implication of such an assumption is that no saving will be needed at the end of the second period. So then we can simplify the model by making only one saving decision. So the second assumption we make for this model is that the agents is exhaustion given the first period income, second period income, and the initial wealth. And that is exactly what we say when we are talking about the two periods model at the beginning of today's class. Finally, we also make the other two assumptions. That is, we are given the real interest rate R when we are making the decisions. The last assumption we made is that there is no bequest and no Ponzi game. So why that is so? Well, the reason why we need to assume there is no bequest is because if bequest is allowed, then it means that when a person die, the person can have the incentive to save something for the future generations. But we don't want that happen to simplify the model. So we need to make an assumption that there is no bequest. So why we want to make the assumption that there is no Ponzi game? That is because when there is a Ponzi game, it means that an individual can finance the old debt with the new debt, such that the individual can keep on borrowing without paying it back. And by the time that person dies, that person can leave the debt to someone else and no need to pay it back. And we don't want that things to happen. Therefore, we need to assume that there is no Ponzi game. So then based on these assumptions, we can develop a model that coming up with the rule for consumption choices. And then so the set of the model can be the household making the utility maximization decision for current and future consumptions, which is constrained by the intertemporal budget constraint. So in equations, we can write it like this. We can have the household maximizing the utility and the consumption are the choice variable for this utility maximization problem. And the decisions are made based on the constraint the household face. The constraint the household face is the intertemporal budget constraint. And so we have the present value of the lifetime consumption equal to the present value of the lifetime resources. The reason why in here I write out the present value of the lifetime consumption explicitly is because the consumption in the first period and the second period are our choice variable. So I need to write it down because I don't know how much 
each of them is. However, I am exogenously given the first period income, the second period income, and the initial wealth. Therefore, I know the value of the present value of the lifetime resources. So these are the problem that we are going to solve. So what I'm going to do next is to give you an example about the utility function and then we will go through the utility maximization problem and come up with the decision rules for current and future consumption. So to begin with, we assume that the utility equals log function, which is that we have log CT plus log CT plus one. The CT is current consumption and CT plus one is the future consumption. So then given that we want to maximize our utility, so what we do is that we maximize this function by choosing the CT and CT plus one. However, we are given a constraint. That constraint is the intertemporal budget constraint, which is the present value of the lifetime consumption equal the present value of the lifetime resources. So then how to solve this problem? To begin with, we want to set up something called Lagrangian. For this Lagrangian, we set it equal the following. We say it will equal the objective function plus a term that is called Lagrangian multiplier, multiply the constraint that in this problem, which is the intertemporal budget constraint. And then we, once we solve the Lagrangian, then we will be able to come up with the answer to CT and CT plus one that maximize our constraints, which is the intertemporal budget constraints. So to begin with, to solve this problem, we know that for sure the constraints need to be satisfied. So then we know at the end, the household is going to choose the point where the present value of the lifetime consumption equal the present value of the lifetime resources. In addition to that, we do the first order derivative with respect to CT and CT plus one, we set it equal zero, and then we are going to come up with the relationship between CT and CT plus one. So how to do that? To begin with, we have the derivative on the Lagrangian with respect to CT, and then we are going to have the one over CT because the derivative of the log CT over CT will be equals one over CT. And then the remaining equation that contains the term that is CT is in the constraints. So then we are going to have minus lambda because we have the derivative on the minus CT lambda with respect to CT. So we are going to get minus lambda and then we set it equal zero. Similarly, we have the derivative with respect to CT plus one and then we are going to have one over CT plus one because the derivative of the log CT plus one equals one over CT plus one. And then the, for the whole equation, the other part that contains CT plus one is also in the constraint, which is minus CT plus one over one plus R multiply the Lagrangian multiplier. So then what we are going to get will be minus lambda multiplied by one over one plus R. And then again, we need to set this term equal zero. So then we have three equations. Equation one is the first order derivative on Lagrangian with respect to CT. The second equation is the first order derivative on the Lagrangian with respect to CT plus one. And the third equation is the budget constraints. So then when we solve for these systems of equation, from the first equation, we are going to get CT equals one over lambda. And from the second equation, we are going to get CT plus one over one plus R equal one over lambda. That is because for the first equation, we just put the lambda to the right hand side, or you can think about adding lambda to both the right hand side and the left hand side of the equation. 
and then we are going to get ct equals one over lambda so then by doing the similar things we can add lambda over one plus r to both the left hand side and right hand side of the equation and then we can flip the numerator and the denominator for both the left hand side of the equation and the right hand side of the equation and then we are going and then we are going to get ct plus 1 over 1 plus r equals 1 over lambda. Therefore, from those two results, we are going to get the relationship between ct and ct plus 1, which is that the ct equals ct plus 1 over 1 plus r. Then we can plug this term into the third equation. And then what we are going to get is that the two times of ct, because now we can replace the ct plus 1 over 1 plus r with ct. And then so we are going to get 2 ct on the left hand side of the equation. We keep the right hand side of the equation. And then we are going to get that the ct will equal a half of the present value of the lifetime resources. Given that the relationship between ct and ct plus 1 is that the ct plus 1 equals 1 plus r multiplied the ct. And then we can also get the ct plus 1 equal a half of the present value of the lifetime resources multiplied by 1 plus r. So let's pause for a second and look at these answers carefully. And then you will find that this result somehow reveal the tendency of consumption smoothing. That is because the decision rule tell us we are going to choose the first period consumption equal the present value of the second period consumption, no matter what is the amount of the present value of the lifetime resources. So then we know that we are going to choose the current consumption equal to the present value of the future consumption. So then it tells us that we are going to have the consumption across time roughly the same from the perspective of present value. So then what is the graphical presentation for this particular problem? As you may recall from what you learned in microeconomics, we know that if we want to maximize the utility, we are going to choose the consumption bundle that is on the indifference curve and tangent on the budget constraint such that our utility is maximized and we use up all the budgets. So we do the same thing in here. We have a budget constraint, which is the intertemporal budget constraint. And then we are going to choose the point that the indifference curve changing on the intertemporal budget constraint is the consumption bundle we choose in here that relates the current consumption and the future consumption.